Our second scripture reading today continues the trial scene from our first reading, in which the apostles Peter and John defended their beliefs and actions before the authorities. Throughout history, the Christian movement has not always been part of the established powers. We continue to read from Acts chapter 4. The consul was caught by surprise by the confidence of which Peter and John spoke. After all, they understood that these apostles were uneducated and inexperienced. They also recognized that they had been followers of Jesus. However, since the heel man was standing with Peter and John before their own eyes, they had no rebuttal. After ordering them to wait outside, the consul members began to confer with each other. What should we do with these men? Everyone living in Jerusalem is aware of the sign performed through them. It's obvious to everyone we can't deny it. To keep it from spreading further among the people, we need to warn them not to speak to anyone in this name. When they called Peter and John back, they demanded that they stop all speaking and teaching in the name of Jesus. Peter and John responded, It's not up to you to determine whether it's right before God to obey you rather than God. As for us, we can't stop speaking about what we've seen and heard. They threatened them further and released them, because public support for Peter and John, they couldn't find any way to punish them. Everyone was praising God for what had happened, because the man who had experienced this sign of healing was over 40 years old. Here ends the reading. May the peace of Christ dwell where the word of God is spoken. Before my sermon today, I want to uh, just address the protester, uh, the fact that we've had a protester at uh, the parking lot driveways today, uh, protesting our stance. Uh, We at Centennial United Methodist Church do believe that uh, the LGBTQ loved ones and neighbors and members and brothers and sisters uh, that they are part of our family. They are part of God's family. And the protester is on public property. He is on the sidewalk. Uh, and so he's within his rights of free speech to be there. Uh, and we do not want to escalate uh, anything with him. Uh, and we keep him in our prayers um, as we keep our LGBTQ of uh, loved ones and members and friends and brothers and sisters in our prayers. And uh, we want you to know uh, our gay and trans friends and loved ones that, that we love you and we stand with you. And so let us pray as we move into our, our sermon today. O God, out of all the words which are spoken this day, out of all the words which are sung, out of all the words which are heard, may it be Your living Word that remains and abides with us through the power of the Spirit and in the name of the Christ we pray. And let everyone say, Amen. You know, here we are in the midst of summer. The midst of summer, August 4th, it is whipping by so fast, but there's another whole month left. Or if you see on the calendar where the fall starts officially, we've got a month and a half of summer left. So take heart, you summer lovers. How do you feel the heartbeat of summer in your life? Maybe it's when you go and tee it up for a round of golf, just hoping to get that handicap down a little bit. Or maybe it's when you take that early morning walk every day before the the dew is no longer heavy on the grass. Or maybe it's when you sense, when you see, when you hear the steaks sizzling on the grill, or the brats, or the burgers, or the veggie burgers. Maybe it's that family reunion. You know, it comes around every year and you're looking forward to to seeing those folks that you haven't seen in five years or two years or one year. Or maybe it's when you're out on the open road finally going up north or going out west 
that feel so good. Or maybe you're out in the woods, or maybe you're on the lake, or maybe you're on your deck, and it's late, and it's late. And you see the afterglow. You swear you can see the afterglow beneath the horizon, even at midnight. I have had the experience these last several days, right outside my office window, talking about, talk about a, a sign of summer. I've had this hummingbird that flutters out there every day. This is not a photo that I took, folks. My, my cell phone wouldn't take that great of a photo through my office window. But it's the heartbeat of summer at what? A thousand heartbeats a minute. All of these are heartbeats of faith because we believe in God, our Creator. Where do you feel the heartbeat of faith in our service today? We feel it as we hold little Martin. And as little Martin got so active and was pointing at me and squirming in his mom's arms and squirming in, in Ted's arms, and we extended blessing to him, blessing as he starts this journey that starts with baptism. We perhaps feel the heartbeat of faith as we sing the great hymns of faith like we will at the end of the service. God of grace and God of glory, on thy people pour thy power. Save us from weak resignation to the evils we deplore. And we feel the, the sound of the pipe organ pulsating through our very being. Maybe we sense the heartbeat of faith as we come here to the Lord's table to receive the holy meal, this simple piece of bread, this simple sip of grape juice, as believers have done down through the ages, as we do together as family, the family of God. Where do you feel the heartbeat of faith today? One of the places I believe that we can feel the heartbeat of faith is in the book of Acts, which is where our scripture came from today. Every time I read from the book of Acts, I feel this heartbeat of faith, this, this vibrant community. It's a sequel to the Gospel of Luke, which is this portrait of Jesus, right? And it's followed by the book of Acts, which is a portrait of the Jesus movement, the earliest church. And so today in our scripture lesson and in the book of Acts as a whole, we feel the heartbeat of faith of passion for people. Passion for people. Why were Peter and John, these early apostles, uh, two of the twelve apostles of Jesus, why were they arrested in our scripture today? It's because they had healed a man who had struggled with health issues all his life. They were continuing the healing ministry of Jesus that we see in the Gospels. And that healing ministry of the Jesus movement continues through the book of Acts. And my question is, what is the healing ministry of the Jesus movement today? Now, certainly we see this in the practice of medicine. Thanks be to God. Certainly we see the healing ministry of the Jesus movement in the life of prayer. We're always seeking to, to weave the energy of love and the energy of the, the mystery of God's Spirit through our congregation and into our lives and beyond our congregation through prayer, however that works. And we also see that healing ministry of Jesus continuing through that listening ear, through that person who comes along somebody else who's really struggling in life and saying, how's it going? How can I listen to your story and what's going on in your life? How many people 
do not have someone who will just listen to them and listen to them from their hearts, I think the number of those people is more than we might expect. I know a man who could volunteer for any number of things in the church and do them well, do them really well. But you know what he says to me? He says, the thing that I think I do best is I can visit somebody in the nursing home or I can come alongside someone who's having a rough time in life or I can be there for someone who's going into major surgery or someone who's, who's just been in major surgery. I can walk that path with them. Who is it that you know who's having a rough time who needs somebody just to talk to, someone just to care, someone just to listen? We're called to be part of the healing ministry of the Jesus movement. Second today, we feel the heartbeat of faith in the book of Acts and in our scripture today. As we see Peter and John teaching where? They're teaching at the temple. The grand, great, beautiful Jerusalem temple. This was the center point for the public worship of the Israelites, the public worship of the Jewish people there in the first century. They came not only from around Palestine, but they came from around the Roman Empire to worship in that place. Now, as human beings, we are spiritual and physical creatures, right? And so we need physical places to help center ourselves and be in worship together. We need a place to worship. We need a place to breathe together, to pray together, to to share our woes together, to praise God together, to explode in gratitude together, to listen with common intent together. We need a place. That's why this is called a sanctuary. It comes from the Latin word sanctus, which means holy, which means set apart which means a place to be together, to be set apart, to be with God. Because it's not just a solo journey, it's a journey together. But it's not a place to be set apart so that we close our eyes and our hearts and our ears to what's going on in the world. It's a place set apart to open ourselves to the world, to open our souls to God, to open our souls to Christ's heart for all the world, every person, every person. And so we're doing an interesting thing in our public worship uh, starting this summer. Yes, we are having communion on the first Sunday every month, and that's today, where in the big church we come to the Lord's table where generation after generation has received the love of Christ in physical form, and generation after generation of those who follow Jesus will come after us to this table. Yes, we come together in this kind of big church communion, but we just started this this summer where on the third Sunday of every month, We will invite people, anyone, to come forward 15 minutes after the benediction and gather right here in a circle. Whether we've got 15 people or 35 people or 55 people, to hold hands, to pray together, maybe sometimes to sing together, don't get scared. Maybe sometimes to be quiet together and listen for the still small voice of God together. And to commune together. And as we hold hands around that circle, we look across, we look around, and we see part of the Jesus movement from this time and this place, and how that Jesus movement then, that circle, radiates ever outward. Yeah, we need a place to worship, whether it's in the large worshiping community, community or small worshiping communities. 
All right, third and finally today, we feel the heartbeat of faith in the book of Acts. We, we feel the heartbeat of faith in our scripture today as Peter and John are defending their faith in Jesus. Their faith in Jesus in front of this council of religious professionals. The people who have arrested Peter and John are the chief priests and the elders and the scribes or the, the, the religious legal scholars. And they've hauled them, Peter and John in front of the council and they're asking them about their faith. They're asking them about this Jesus. And they see that Peter and John, they're fishermen from the Sea of Galilee way up north. They have a decided Galilean accent. They stick out like a sore thumb there in Jerusalem. They do not have the schooling. They do not have the training that they have as religious professionals in all the finer ins and outs of the laws of the, New, of the Old Testament and all of the things that are meant to, to be spiritual about those things. And so they wonder how Peter and John can speak so confidently about the things of God and the things of Jesus and, and talk about the experience of resurrection that they've seen in this Jesus. And they're puzzled about this. And they, we read in our scripture that they recognized that they had been with Jesus. They recognized that they had been with Jesus. Peter and John had been with Jesus as they washed their nets along the shore of the Sea of Galilee and Jesus taught the crowds. Peter and John had been with Jesus as He gave the Sermon on the Mount. Peter and John had been with Jesus as He stood up to the hard-hearted Pharisees and Sadducees who were trying to put up barriers between regular people like you and me and God. Peter and John had been there with Jesus as he touched the untouchable leper of his day. Peter and John had been with Jesus when he washed their feet. Peter and John, no, they had not been with Jesus when he was on the cross. But Jesus came to them and the disciples again and again after the resurrection. And they had been with Jesus when on a mountain Jesus had said, go and make disciples. And look, I'm with you always. No matter what, take that promise to heart of Jesus. I'm with you always. How are you with Jesus this week in deeper ways, in new ways, in renewed ways? How are you with Jesus? Amen. And I'm